Good to be here this morning. Appreciate the good spirit of the Lord that we've felt thus far. I've never been disappointed when the Spirit of God shows up. Amen. It always brings joy to our hearts. It's a familiar love that we have. Amen. It's a familiar love and a spirit that we all commune with if you're in the family of the Lord. Amen. If you're in the family of God. This morning I'd like to be over in Ephesians chapter 4. We'll start reading about verse number 1. I say this often, and eventually it doesn't work out, but I, I'm going to say it this morning. It, it's not a very long message, but uh, we'll just let the Lord lead, amen, and, and, and go with it. But uh, the title of this message is, What is Your Vocation? What is your vocation? We see here in verse number one, before we get started, let's ask Father to bless Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed opportunity, Lord, to stand and break the bread of life. We ask, Lord, that you would uh, put your arms around us, Lord, and, and put your stamp of approval upon this reading of the word. Let it go out and land on fertile ground this morning, Father. We'll praise you and thank you for all things. In the precious name of Christ, we'll pray. Amen and amen. The Apostle Paul here is speaking to the Ephesians. Here in chapter number four, he said, I therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beseech ye that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. I want to do a little explaining here about this first verse here. If you don't understand, it can really throw you. Paul is saying, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Now, let me open your eyes to this concept. If you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, if you've been called by His Spirit and you do the will of the Father and not the will of yourself, you are a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are not imprisoned in a bad way, but you no longer have control over your own life. Amen? Amen. What a blessing that Amen. is to, to not have control yes. over the actions that you want to do. That's right. You see, the flesh is not willing. It's weak. The Bible says the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But if you are a prisoner, you must do what you are told. Amen? Amen. You must do what you have been asked to do, and you do it without murmuring. Now, you don't want the Lord, uh, uh, say you're a prisoner of a, of a camp somewhere, you don't want them to see that you're murmuring. Or you won't want them to see that you're complaining. You're just going to up and do exactly what you should. And that's the concept that Paul's trying to get to you and I this morning. He said, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. How many of you here are prisoners of the Lord? Amen. 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 I am. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. Amen. I belong to him. I no longer belong to myself. Sold out to him. Amen. I sold out everything that I've got. You see, when I threw up the white flag, I mean it. Yes, sir. I'm in it. I'm done. Yeah. I'm yours, Lord. Yeah. Do with me as you see fit. And he does. Amen. And God will use you uh, if you allow him. Amen. He said, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech ye that ye walk worthy of your vocation. What is this word vocation? This is the calling that you have. Oh, no, I don't have a calling. Oh, oh, oh let's back up real quick. Yeah, come on. I want you to recognize this morning that every human being in the world has a calling. We all have a vocation. It's not all of the same, but we all have a vocation that we have to be used of the Lord, one way or another. Amen. Think of it like this. I could probably reach people that you would never ever meet or see. You could reach people that I may never get a chance to even be around. Right. So therefore, it's needed. Father needs us all uh, placed in the position that we are for a reason. So that we can do the will of the Father. So that we can teach the Word of God with clarity, with understanding, and not be ashamed of our vocation. Not to be ashamed of what God has given you to do. 
It's a blessing, friends. Amen. When you come to the knowledge of your vocation, when you come Amen. to the knowledge of your calling, when you finally feel as if, wow, I don't know where that came from, kind of thing. I don't know how that happened, but wow, it, what a blessing. Or, I don't know how I, I accomplished that part, but wow. It's as if you had a reckoning of something before. Let's say it in that fashion. Amen. And it's very common. A lot of people today don't realize that they have a calling. The majority of people like to come in and sit on the seat of do nothing and be taught and be fed, you see. But yet it's important that we, as we get nourished and we come to the knowledge of the truth and understanding, that we go out and do what? That we spread the Word of God. Amen. That's what we are here for, Amen. to spread God's Word, Amen. to let people know that there is a free pardon of sin, first and foremost. We got to do what? We got to first get them saved, Brother Mike. Right. You got to first let them know uh, that they got to come with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Amen. You can't come popping gum and whistling a song of the world and expect that for Christ to come and save your soul. Amen. 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 You must come uh, one way. There's a criteria, you see. Right. Once we get them to the understanding of that, then we can get them off the milk, Brother Bob, and begin to give them that word. Begin to teach them the word of God. Amen. Where they'll nourish up and grow up and be beautiful trees planted by the water. Amen? Amen. That's what God wants. Yes, sir. That's what he expects of us. Amen. He said <clears throat> that you walk worthy of the vocation. Now, this worthiness now, guys, is very important. It's not to be thrown to the side. It's not to be uh, kicked around and just uh, use it uh, whenever you see fit, maybe for profit or uh, for gain's sake. I'll say it on TV. I'll say it on the Facebook. I'll say it here in this church. I don't get a dime for doing what I do. Amen. But I do it because I love it. Amen. It's in me. Amen. If I didn't do it... <laughs> I'm like the Word of God. The rocks would cry out if I didn't do it. I mean to tell you guys, I've got to do it. Amen. And I would that you would have that same zeal. Amen. Not that I'm any better than you. I'm not no better than you. I've got a zeal in my heart, and I've got a Word that I've got to teach. I've got to do that. If I don't, friends, I'm worthless in my life. My spirit is weak, and then I'll get depressed. And I've been there. I'm telling you something I've lived, okay? I get to a point where I just feel like I'm not worthy any longer. I've got to be doing God's will. Amen. So it's what he wants us to do. He said here in verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, bearing one another in love. We need to realize that when the gift that God gives to you and I comes when we recognize it. Let me say this. It is not your gift. So if he's allowing you to use it, you need to be very careful about what you do and how you do it and how often you do it. If you put it off and lay it to the side, you may be like that unprofitable servant. It's very important that you listen and you use. How do you listen? You listen with your spirit. When the spirit of God comes through you and you're standing in the Walmart parking lot talking to somebody that's lost, or if you're at the barber shop or you're at the grocery store and the conversation comes about and the opportunity and the spirit of God wells up inside of you and you have that opportunity, friend, don't quench the spirit. Do it. Quench not the Spirit of God. For this gift that you have is not your gift. If we get on down in the chapter here, you'll see what I'm talking about. He said, forbearing one another in love. We must show love, and not only in the physical, but in the spiritual. We must spiritually love what another one's teaching. If you can honestly say that you enjoy that teaching, friend, you're going to be back. Okay? That's just the bottom line. 
you're going to come back to where you're fed. You take them cattle out there, and, and you take it, and, and you put the hay bob over in a different spot tomorrow. You see how many of them go to the old spot first off. Eventually, they might eventually get over and smell that hay. But they're going to go to the same old spot every day. Same way with you and I. We need to go where we're fed. Amen? Yes, I appreciate you coming to the house of the Lord today. Not only do I appreciate you, but Father appreciates you. Amen. He appreciates that you're coming, and he expects me, as the pastor, to prepare the message that will help the people. Thank you, Lord. Regardless if you've heard it a thousand times. Thank you, Lord. Regardless if it's something that you know already. Repetition. Regardless, it's going to help you some way, somehow. Amen. It's going to come into your remembrance sometime during the week, and it may help you, okay? That's right. Amen. He said in verse 3, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. <laughs> You know what this endeavoring to keep means? It means to study the Word of God. Endeavoring to keep. You must study God's Word and stay sharp with the Word. If I got a pocket knife and I use that thing every day, Paul, and I don't ever take it to the whetstone and I don't ever put a good sharp edge on it, what good is it going to be to me on down the road. You must keep it sharp. Same with you. You must stay sharp with the Word of God. You must get in God's Word and read it. it I, I'm sorry, that I don't mean to make it sound as if you don't. Let's take it and say that you do. Okay, let's go ahead and say that you get into the Word of God probably every day. By doing that, you stay sharp. Not only about what God is saying, but it refers in your memory where it's at. Amen. And it refers to where you can always transfer. When you're in that Walmart parking lot, and you've got your Bible over in the car, you can walk over and you can flip and say, see here, this is what I'm talking about. That's staying sharp. That's being ready at an instant. Always ready. When I was in the military, I was in the infantry. And that was one of our motto call, always ready. We were always a ready unit, ready to go out and fight battle at any hour of the day, 24-7. Always ready. And God expects us to do the same. We should be ready. He knows whether or not you're ready. It's up to you to prove that God is correct and that he can use you. Okay? He said... <clears throat> In verse number four, there is one body and one spirit, and even as you are called in one hope of your calling. One body meaning that there is only one body, the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. The one body. Let's walk over to Romans chapter 12 real quick. Romans 12. Verse number four. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. Did you get that? A lot of people are in the body, but not everybody. Here. You see, that my earlobe can't do a thing for my pinky, but yet they are all part of the body. You understand? He said, verse five, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one member one of another. That is important that you realize that. That the body of Christ, it takes us all, folks. Why is it today we see such a division amongst the people today? Why is it that we see so much a division amongst God's people? We call ourselves Christ men, do we not? Christians. But yet we see that there's a division because of how I teach or how I believe or what songs I allow or what songs that we sing. You see, there should not be of any of that. The great apostle told us, he said, let there be no division among you. Don't allow these things to rear itself up. Don't allow it to...
fester up inside your heart and find fault in your brother. Hey, you look close enough, you'll find all kinds of fault in this old boy. Please overlook them. Pray for me, we can. Pray for me, and I'll pray for you. Amen. And that we continue to stay in unity one with another. Amen. We don't need to lose nobody. That's right. We don't have a whole lot of folks that's really teaching the Word of God today. Amen. We need to all stay together in the family as closely as we possibly can. If one hurts, we all should hurt. Amen? Amen. That's what the Word said. Pray ye one for another. Bear ye one another's burdens. And if we do these things, friends, we grow together. We're concerned. As the right hand washes the left, you see, it takes care of itself. That's what it needs to happen inside the body of the church of Christ. God's home, where you and I can be united. Although we see so many people today that they, they won't listen, they, they have a different idea, they have a different concept. Friend, there's no different ideas, there's no different concept, there's no different interpretations. It's all one word. Amen. One word. Verse number five says it all. One Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Amen. That's what the Word of God teaches us. There is one Lord, Amen. one Jesus. Amen? Not two. Not a fake one, but one Jesus, one Lord in our life. You have one Lord in your life. Amen. You should be a prisoner to that Lord. You should love him with all that you have. He should be first in your life, over and above your wife, over and above your husband, over and above your grandkids, over and above your babies. I'm sorry. That's how it works. If you put him second seat, you'll never find a blessing coming down your way. If you put God first in your home, in your life, friends, he'll open up a door in heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you cannot contain. I've seen it. Ask me about it one time. I'll tell you. You put God first and let him be the Lord of your life. You can't go wrong, guys. You cannot go wrong. He said one Lord and we have one faith. We have one faith. We do not waver on our faith. We do not waver. We are on a what? A solid rock. A solid foundation. Our rock is not the world's rock. Amen? Deuteronomy 32 teaches us that we have a rock and a father that is not of the world, but of his children. You became one of his children long before you ever come through this earth. Amen? Amen? You became one of his children way before you ever was clothed with this flesh. You became one of his children when he created you when he did. Amen. He said, I knew you when? Before the foundations of the world. Amen. Uh, some people may have never read that. I don't make these things up. He said, I knew you before the foundations of the world. If that don't blow your mind, I don't know what will. Amen. It blew my mind the first time I ever went across that as a young Christian. I thought, Lord, how in the world could he know me before my mama ever had me? Oh, that means that I was before. Yeah. Yes, you were before. We all were before. Amen. That's how he knew you. But we have one faith. Our faith is, is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We believe he done what? We believe he went to the cross ungrudgingly, yes. loving you and I. Yes. Yes. We preached there Wednesday night, you were on his mind. Amen. And I believe that God knew exactly where you would be. Why did I think that? Because I know that God don't make no mistakes. Amen. And he don't send somebody in early. Yeah. He don't send somebody in late. He sends somebody in at the right time. Amen. I was born in 1963. That was the exact time when God wanted me here. Amen. How is it that I've lived this long? Only through and by the grace of God, Brother Amen. Paul. Amen. You ever been around sometimes you think, wow, I don't know how I got through that. Oh, I'm glad I did. Amen. Or boy, boy, if I hadn't just, if something hadn't happened right then, I, I could have been killed. I could have been. You see, God has you on his interest. God has you on his mind. 
You are very important to the fathers, especially. Now, if I'd been preaching this message 100 years ago, it may not have been the impact that it is today. But today, you are very much needed for this time that you're living in, this generation that you and I are living in. Okay? So we have one Lord and one faith, and we have one baptism. Oh, I think I need to get saved again. Let me open your mind to what this word is trying to tell you. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit of God, that is when you become one of His. That's when you have accepted His Spirit. We're not talking about water baptism that where man accepts because of, uh, we want you to come into the church, but you've got to be baptized by the water, or you must be back. It's not about that. That brings honor unto the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and shows men that you are faithful to that. That's all that does. Many people say, well, I'm going to change church. I'm going to get baptized again. That has nothing to do with it. What it means is, is that you are born again. That you have given your heart and your life and that to the Lord. When you enter into this baptism, how many of you here can remember when you got saved? Let's call it that. You got saved. At that very moment, you were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That's what that means. Exactly what it means for you today. And without that baptism, without that holiness that the Spirit of God came in and dwelt with you at that very moment, friend, you're none of His. The Word. That's what the Word says. And it's important that we exercise that. I've got some old stuff at the house I don't get to see very often, Mike. But I like it, you know, and I'll pull it out every now and again. It don't mean that much to me. But that what God gave me, that spirit that He gave me, I like exercising it as often as I possibly can. It doesn't matter to me if I'm on the job or if I'm at the restaurant or here in the house of God. I want to exercise what God has given to me. I want it to be familiar to me. Does that make sense to you? I want it to be familiar to me. I want it to be something in my life that I always use and it's always there. Not just on Sundays. Not just on Wednesdays. I'm talking every day of your life. You should have that Spirit of God flowing with you. Exercise it, okay? Use it more, yeah. as much as you possibly can. Verse 6, one God and Father of all. How many of you believe that this morning? Amen. amen. Should have got a big amen right there. Amen. He said, one God and Father of all, A-L-L, -L, who is above all and through all and in you all. Nothing happens without God's consent. Do you believe that? Yes. As many today do not want to come to the realization that we will go through a tribulation period. They're scared to death that something's going to happen to them because they can't live the gospel that they've heard preached. That's it in a nutshell. I'm, t I'm telling you the truth this morning. And it's sticking to the walls too, friends. Amen. Many people have heard things in their life that they can't live, so therefore they're scared to death. That being said, God will not allow anything to come down your path that He does not consent of. And He will never overload your barrel. He'll never put no more on you than you can bear. Now you say to yourself, well, golly, that's no bar, boy. He's got a heck of a load. Hey, maybe that person can handle that. That's between them and the Lord. But I want to say this, that God will never hurt you. Amen. God is for you. Yes. He's for you to grow. He's for you to learn. He's for you to trust. He's for you in that to gain confidence in. And at the whole same time, You've willed your life and you're a prisoner unto his son. Father said, If I be lifted, Christ said, If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Amen. God loves it when you lift up his son. Amen? Amen. 
ain't nothing better, Veronica, than your boy or, get, or your daughter or whatever. If somebody's talking about it and you're talking good about it, boy, it just puts a big smile on your face. What well, makes you feel good, you see. That's the same way God feels. You don't think God has feelings? He has feelings just like you and I. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. So we do that all we possibly can. Lift up the Lord. Verse 7. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Never let someone hold you back from exercising your gift. If you are in a place where you are trying to do the will of the Lord, and I know maybe we have got a, quite a few listeners this morning that are not in company with like believers because they can't find a place. And they have separated themselves away from that body because they don't believe the same. Amen. On the same concept, never let somebody hold you back of exercising your gift. Friends, I'm telling you firsthand, I know all about it. I've had it in my life. I've had people tell me I didn't know what I was talking about. I've had people laugh at me. I've had people throw things at me. I've had people take and just not want to listen whatsoever. That's when you finally get done with what you're doing and you find a place where God can use you. Amen. You go and you find a place where the Lord can be you. Yes. And He can express through you. As I said earlier in the earlier part of the, ch of the service, we are vessels. God wants to be able to utilize you and I. Yes. We are to be the vessels of honor, not of dishonor. Amen. Make sure that at any time that you've got this gift and you're trying to exercise, that nobody gets in your way. I've seen it happen so many times, Paul. Somebody young in the Lord want to stand in and, 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 and they just want to mow the yard. But you got that one over there. Well, we can't afford to pay him, and uh, we ain't gonna let we ain't gonna let him in on it, friend. If somebody wants to be the doorkeeper in the house of God, Amen. let them do it. Yes. Let them do it. Blessing. Don't begrudge anybody from that opportunity of yeah. being a blessing. That's right. When you, when you cover up the hands of God and don't allow God to work through an individual, friends, you talking about a condemnation that's going to come upon me. Friends, we've all seen it. We've all been around it. Don't have to go in too deep of a detail to tell you. It just breaks your heart. Somebody told me once before, he said, you know, I, I've been in love several times and fell out of love. And my heart broke. But nobody ever broke my heart like a fellow Christian did. Yep, that's true. That is Amen. so true. You'll never get hurt. Like you get hurt when you're amongst friends. Yes. They asked Jesus, said, where did you get these stripes? Where did you get these bruises and these wounds? In the house of my friends. What he said. It's important you watch how you treat people. Yes. It's important you watch how you treat children. You know what happens to children after you feed them for a few years, Paul? They grow up to be adults. Amen. Yeah. They do. And you've got to be very aware of that, okay? Yeah. So that what you're giving out as they are young, be very cautious about how you act and how the things you do and the things you teach. Make sure that they're right. Amen. Amen. Make sure. Verse 8. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, he led captive, captive. He led the captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. I told you earlier here in verse 2 that uh, we were going to talk about how that the gifts didn't belong to you. <coughs> they don't belong to you. They belong to the Lord. Let's turn over to Psalm 68. 
Psalm 68 and verse 18. I'll give you a moment to get there. I want to really, really emphasize this morning on how that this gift is not your gift. Claude, if I come over and I borrow the most prized possession that you've got, you're going to let me know. You say, look here now, I'm going to let you borrow this. But I want you to know that this means a lot to me. Please take care of it. Please take care of it. This is the same concept that the Lord has when he gives you this gift. 68 and 18, thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Did you see that? Did you get that? What he's saying is, you can't have God to dwell amongst you unless you receive that gift from the Lord. Amen. That blessed gift, what is that gift? Whatever it may be, friends, not all of us have the same gift. But that what you do, exercise it in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you're the best corn grower in the world, exercise that in the Lord. Amen. God expects us to take these gifts and don't throw them aside. Kathy just had a birthday today. And I know good and well she's not going to take what few gifts that she's had given to her by her friends that love her, and she's not going to slang them off in the corner somewhere. She's going to appreciate them. Amen. She's going to love them. Same with you and I. These gifts that God gives us, friends, are greater than any monetary value of the world. Amen. You know what it's doing when you exercise your gift? Not only are you getting sharp, but the Bible says you're doing what? You're laying up treasures in heaven. Every time you stand behind the pulpit and preach the word of God, every time you witness to an individual and you tell them about the love of Christ, every time that you give honor to the Lord, yeah. friends, you're laying up treasures in heaven. Amen. It's more important than anything of this world where the thief can't steal and where the moth can't come in the store. It's important that we exercise this. It's important that we know that God expects us to do these things. Verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Now, you take the average individual, and a lot of people didn't know that Jesus went to hell. Oh, not my Jesus. My Jesus went straight into heaven. Well, 40 days after he went into the grave, he did. After he resurrected, and 40 days later, he ascended into heaven. But you see, the Lord had work to do. Let's go over there to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3 and 19. We're going to confirm something here. I love confirmation, don't you? That leaves the guessing out of it. It leaves old Randall clean out of it. Let's get old Randall out of the way and let the Holy Spirit do the teaching. Amen? Verse 19. Let's go to 18 first. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. How many believe that this morning? Amen. You must believe that. That is the criteria that you must believe to be a Christian. Amen. Verse 19. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. <coughs> In prison. Now, did, did he go over here to Brushy Mountain? In, or did he go down there to... No, friends. What does Luke 16 talk about? 
It talks about there's a place in paradise, and then on the opposite side of paradise, we'll call it this prison, okay? These people are there, but they cannot pass over. But why in the Lord did he go there? Why did our Father send Jesus down to where people were in prison? They've already been sentenced. Well, through ignorance, before the coming of the Lord, people kind of put them own self into condemnation by ignorance. They didn't understand. They didn't know. But by Christ going to the prison, what did he do? He went down there and he preached unto them salvation. He preached unto them a salvation. Boy, I'd love to have heard that, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love to have heard our Savior preach a salvation message? Not only that, but see the grove of people that would come out and follow him that very day. What a blessing that would have been, friends. What about the fools that stayed? What about the fools that rejected him at that grand opportunity? Grand opportunity. The gates are open. All you got to do is just walk out. All you have to do is just accept me. What much grander would that have been? You see, hell was not emptied on that day. Many stayed behind. What a foolish person that is. 20. For some time were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was of preparing Wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. And it goes on to talk about how that Christ did this because of all of those that didn't understand. God did not want anyone to be able to stand, Paul, and say, I never had an opportunity. Oh, yes, you did. Oh, yes, you did. And he said, not only did you, but I went back. And allowed my son. You see, he gave him what? He gave him the key to death, hell, and the grave. He held the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And he opened it up and let those that were captive come out. What a blessing that is, friends. What a Jesus that we serve. What a prisoner that we are. Aren't you glad you're a prisoner this morning? I am so glad. I am so glad. Verse number 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might feel all things. Now this fight that we're going to talk about he said here, he ascended above all heavens, far above all the heavens. Not just into the heavens, but he ascended far above the heavens that he might feel all things. The fight that we all have is between the flesh body and the living soul body. We all have this fight. Can you say amen? amen. And it is our spirit that controls both these bodies. You understand that? You have a flesh body and you have a soul. But it is your spirit, which is the intellect of a man, that controls the both of them. It controls your flesh and it controls your spirit, your soul, you understand. When our spirit is led by the Holy Spirit, we are in fellowship with God. But when our spirit is acting on its own, then this flesh body wins out and we sin. That's why the word talks about that we are to crucify the flesh. Now, he didn't talk about stigmata and all these. It's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about lashing yourself. 
He's talking about keeping yourself under control. Oh, yeah. There's things that I've done when I was 16, but, uh, Bob, that I won't do today. I won't do it today, okay? There was things I've done when I was a kid that I ain't going to do today. I know better. And I don't allow my body to go and do those type of things. I don't allow my flesh to get into that type of position. Once we repent, then our spirit yields to the will of God and His Spirit, and those sins are forgiven, and we are back in the fellowship with the Father. Amen. What's the key to that? Repentance. When? Every day. Every day. It's important that you stay repented and cleaned up. I mentioned earlier in the service how I knew of a man that just passed. Had no reasoning for passion. Do we any know when we're going to go? No, we don't. Good to have a clean slate. Amen? Good to have a clean slate when you go. Verse number 11 to come to a close. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Still talking about this gift that he has given. Still talking about this gift that when he ascended above the heavens, that he may fulfill all things. These things is what he is talking about. How that he will direct the lives of you and I through the Holy Spirit. He said, I go away, but I will not leave you comfortless. It's the Holy Spirit that will direct you and I. Amen. But he's called some. Each gift is for a specific purpose. The evangelist gives more of a stirring message to jar the sinner into repentance. That's what an evangelist is. While the pastor is to nourish the flock and give strength and guidance for their daily lives. That's what the pastor is for. To make sure the flock is fed and nourished. And you got a, a clear heart and a clear mind about questions that you have about the mysteries of the Word of God. The teacher is to present the very meaning in the terms the Christian can understand. In many cases, the pastor is the teacher. This is how he's expected this to work. But the problem is today that many of the pastors and teachers are ignorant of the God's Word and the flock is not fed with the proper nourishment of God's Word. In other words, the sheep are starving. In other words, many people out here do not understand that they have a gift. And that gift comes from the Lord. And it belongs from the Lord. It belongs to Him. And you are to exercise it in the fullness. You are to give your best that you possibly can. You are to study that you can be that one that can be used. You are to study the Word. You know, the good part about it is in Sunday school, we already know where we're at. Amen, teacher? We already know where we're at. We know where we're going to be next Sunday. I've got a commission to you to read ahead and prepare yourself. Have them questions ready. What does this mean, teacher? What does that mean? That makes the whole class learn at the same time. Never, ever, ever, ever is there a stupid question. All questions need to be answered. The only stupid question is, is the one you didn't ask. Never hold back that opportunity to allow the spirit to flow from breast to breast. It'll come probably when the simplest question is asked. We've seen it break open in our Sunday school hour before. How that just the simplest thing come about before we know it, we're all converting. Everyone's got a concept and it's all working in harmony together and it's clarifying the Word of God. 
These gifts that you have, friends, this is your vocation. What's your vocation this morning? Ephesians 4. 